Hello, and welcome to this Understanding Pain video. I'm Alex, an advanced physiotherapy practitioner in pain management, and I'll be taking you through this approximately 30 minute video. So let me start by saying thank you. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. You have been sent this as part of your intervention with iPass pain, and the information provided in this video and the attached handout are the foundation to any further input within the service. The aim of this video is to provide you with a better understanding of your pain, what it is, as well as what it isn't. As we all know, understanding a condition is paramount to managing it. And once we have explored pain, I hope to provide you with some ideas for you to use in managing your own symptoms. What I will say now is that medicine has not found that magic wand to get rid of pain. So let's get started. What is pain? Let's have a ponder about those questions. What is it for? How does it happen? And is it normal? Just because you can't see pain does not make it not real. Pain is a sensation which affects a behaviour change, just as thirst, hunger and tiredness. It is the body's way of communicating to us that it feels threatened. Either a real or a potential threat can lead to a response of pain. The body does this to protect us from harm, again real or, or potential, and is able to do this by using the nervous system to detect things. There are no pain sensors, but there are danger sensors. If the body believes it to be in danger, then the nerves will fire at an intensity which exceeds a threshold leading to a pain response. This will often lead to a behaviour change. So, for example, not putting weight on a broken ankle, sitting down if our back is sore or standing up. The nervous system is not just the nerves in the back or the ankle, wherever you're experiencing your symptoms, but also the brain. And it is the brain that decides if something is a threat to us or not. It does this by using the current information being provided by all those free nerve endings in the body, as well as our past experiences, the context of a situation, our understanding and knowledge, the potential impact, our beliefs, lots of information. And it's only once it's balanced all of this information, it will then decide if it needs to provide that pain response or not. And this is how we can do something one day and feel OK, but do the same thing on another day and be in pain or more pain. In a nutshell, pain is a mixture of the biological, the psychological and the social. But this is all well and good in an acute situation. But when we have had pain for an extended period of time, so longer than the natural healing times for the tissues in the body, then it is called chronic pain. And this occurs as a result of the nervous system becoming oversensitized or being overprotective. So, for example, a car alarm will go off if somebody's breaking into it. However, your car alarm system has been set so sensitive that now just a cat brushing past it is enough to set it off. So, well, pain, as the International Association for, Stud for the Study of Pain has defined, is a sensory and an emotional experience. So, bearing that in mind, how do you describe your pain? What words do you use to explain to your doctor what you're feeling? Take a couple of moments to think about the words you would use.
For lots of my patients, they describe their pain as both sensory, so the primary pain experience, and emotional, the secondary suffering. And looking at this slide, would you agree? The thing is, these emotions associated with the person's pain experience, they can then further heighten that sensitivity of the nervous system, which in turn can lead to an increased intensity of that primary pain. So you can see how things feed into that vicious cycle. Have you ever noticed that your back is more noticeable when you're tired and fed up? Or your neck is really tight when you're stressed? Or if you're distracted doing something that you love, that you enjoy with those loved ones, for example, that you're able to go on for a longer period of time before your symptoms flare up. As we move through this presentation, hopefully things will start to make a bit of sense. As I mentioned, pain is there to affect a behaviour change, and this is what that looks like graphically. The purple line demonstrates boom and bust. And I'm sure some of you watching this will recognise the pattern of pushing through your pain until the job is done and then paying for it for a few days after where you're not able to do as much. By pushing through, you are not causing harm, but you are maintaining and sometimes increasing that sensitivity of the nervous system even further. This leads to the next time not quite being able to do as much. This progression can continue on, leading to periods where you pay for it lasting longer. And these contribute then further to the body becoming deconditioned. The green line again shows the body becoming deconditioned, but this time it's when you stop as soon as you start to feel your pain. So if we were used to walking the dog for an hour and then you get the pain after, say, 50 minutes, you now only walk the dog for 50 minutes. But then you start to notice you get your symptoms at 40 minutes. So then the same goes. You reduce the time you walk as you're worried that pushing into your pain is going to do you more harm than good. So this continues. And then one day you notice that where you were initially able to walk the dog for an hour, over time, this is now reduced to, say, 15, 20 minutes. Whichever route you take, or even if you're a bit of both, the result is still the same. Your pain threshold reduces, meaning that you are able to do less before your pain starts. Your pain tolerance is really good, as that is the level you're able to cope with. But the threshold at which you start experiencing your pain has been reduced. So let's take a different approach to pain. You see in front of you a graph. Along the x-axis is the amount of tissue damage and up the y-axis is the pain level or the intensity. And we're often brought up to believe that the amount of pain we are in equals or has that linear relationship to the amount of tissue damage. But is this true? In some cases, yes. So, for example, a sprained ankle or a broken bone. But in other instances, no. Take a paper cup, for example. We all agree this is a painful experience. But does the pain intensity relate to the amount of tissue damage? No. So why does it hurt as much? There are a couple of reasons. Let me explain. So this funny person in front of you is a representation of what we look like to our brains. Areas of the body which are important to our survival have a larger area represented in the brain. Hands, lips, tongue, chest, sexual organs, feet are all required for our survival and survival of the species. So going back to that paper cut, we are successful as a species as we have opposable thumbs and we have excellent dexterity. 
Just look at how well we can text away on our phones or use equipment, pick away at something. This allows us to do lots with our hands and help us to survive. Therefore, our hands are important to our survival and the brain prioritises them as such. By doing lots with our hands, we have developed a dense neural network with information constantly being delivered to the brain regarding pressure, temperature, proprioception, so knowing where our joints are, chemicals, things like inflammation, sharp touch, light touch. So the brain is constantly acknowledging and focused on our hands. So if we then go and slice the tip of our finger on a bit of paper, that is going to be painful as the brain sees this as an injury which could potentially be harmful and could impact our survival. Other examples are stubbing your toe for similar reasons. We walk around on two feet, therefore to maintain our balance, the brain is receiving lots of information from the foot and ankle. A migraine or a headache has no tissue damage associated with it but maybe coming from tightness in the muscles around the neck, eye strain, hormone imbalance, lots of different reasons, but not from tissue damage. Conversely, we have situations where we would expect an intense pain response, but this is delayed. Examples of this would be in traumatic situations, such as conflict or in a road traffic accident, for example. Why is this? Adrenaline, I hear you shout. <laughs> yes, in part. The response is for the body to produce adrenaline, amongst other things. And it does this as part of the survival mechanism. The body will always prioritise life over limb. Let me give you an example. Crossing the road. A normal road. You want to go from one side to the other, so you step across, except there is a pothole and you go over on your ankle and it hurts. You are in pain. Therefore, you limp tragically wounded across to the other side. Now, if I change that situation slightly, you are again crossing the road and again you go over on your ankle in that pothole, which is going to be painful. But this time, there's a great big number 52 double-decker bus hurtling towards you at 30 miles an hour. Do you limp slowly, tragically wounded to the other side? <laughs> no, you hurl yourself out of the way of that bus. And it's only once you're in that place of safety do you again start to feel the ankle. But let's also go back to our stubbed toe. And let's pop a little bit of context into that. So let's imagine the alarm goes off and you step out of bed and you stand onto Lego. I think we'd all agree that is painful. Now let us change the situation and context just slightly. Instead of the alarm going off, you're woken by a phone call from the National Lottery saying you have just won £56 million on the Euro Millions. You again step out of bed and onto that piece of Lego. But is it as painful? No. But how come? Because the body is now flooded with endorphins that have an inhibitory effect on the nervous system, meaning you don't feel it as much. You may later, once that elatory effect has worn off, but you get where I'm going. So now I hope that this graph makes a bit more sense and also provides you with some reassurance that pain and tissue damage do not always equate. And previously we have gone through some theoretical scenarios, but now let's give a couple of case scenarios. So this is Mr Chen and he was minding his own business, walking down the road when he felt what he described as a drip, like a raindrop on his head. Rain, well, that's not harmful. That doesn't pose a threat. Therefore, he carried on walking without giving it much more thought. But as he walked down the road, people were pointing and waving. He took his hand to his head to check it out. I mean, it could have been bird poo. But when he looked at his hand, 
he noticed blood and he felt the knife. Immediately, he started to experience pain. But this was only after the brain had recognised that it was in danger. For those of you who are interested, Mr Chen made a full recovery. What had happened was a knife had slipped out of the person's hand who was cutting herbs from their window box. Conversely, the owner of this boot had jumped from one scaffolding platform to another. On landing, the nail that you can see pierced all the way through his boot. Immediately, the man experienced pain. He was screaming and was taken to hospital. In A&E, they attempted to get his pain under control to enable them to take images to work out the best way to remove the nail. But doctors were unsuccessful in controlling his pain. Therefore, they ended up giving him a general anaesthetic to completely knock him out. This approach did work and they successfully imaged and assessed the damage. What they found was the nail had pierced all the way through, but had missed all the soft tissues going between his toes. Absolutely no tissue damage at all, not even a graze. So this therefore begs the question, was his pain real? Of course it was. The definition of pain, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And to this person here, there was definitely the potential for harm. There was absolutely the potential for tissue damage which then could have had a big impact on his ability to work, resulting in his ability to provide for his family becoming compromised. His pain was absolutely real. So moving on. We are looking now at how imaging is not the whole story, but instead only part of the puzzle and at times a red herring. We know from lots of studies into back pain, neck pain, this pain, that pain, that what we see on imaging does not always correlate with a person's symptoms. Looking at these images, you can see that the top MRI has a lovely bulge, but the person is able to complete the most amazing yoga moves and positions. Whereas the woman on the bottom right of the screen on imaging has a very good looking spinal MRI but is struggling to even do the laundry due to her back pain. Both are real, both are valid. The images just don't correlate. And you too may have had imaging which found nothing, but you still have your pain. Yes, this is reassuring, but it doesn't make sense. Where is my pain coming from? Conversely, those involved in studies who have been imaged as part of the control group, so those with no pain, have been found to have images which show X, Y, and Z, but they're not symptomatic. We know pain is not always structural. We know pain does not always equal harm. Pain is a complex sensation which arises as a result of lots of different things, not just our anatomy or our structure. So you can't see it doesn't mean it's not real, doesn't mean we can't have an effect on it, but it's not going to be a quick fix. In the late 1970s, a cardiac surgeon was intrigued as to why some of his patients had better outcomes than others following identical procedures. After looking into this in detail, George Engel proposed a new health model, the biopsychosocial model which you can see in front of you. He explained we are not just a biological being of muscles, tendons, joints, etc, but have an identity which includes our beliefs, past experiences, expectations. And we live in a social world which has influences from the culture we belong to, our family, 
our role in society, faith, education, financial situation, lots of different things. These three areas do not sit apart from each other, but influence each other. And as a result, we and our pain are directly influenced by all of these things, whether we recognise them or not. Alongside these influences sits our emotion regulation system, which you can see on this slide. So the threat, drive and soothe. The threat system, shown here in red, is activated whenever the brain believes our survival to be compromised. This fight or flight response can be triggered by lots of different things. Feeling angry, being in pain, being scared, worrying about things, watching the news, anxious about COVID, the list goes on. When we feel these things or are in situations which lead us to these feelings, the hormones adrenaline and cortisol are released. This allows us to react quickly by increasing our heart rates, increasing our breathing rate, increasing muscle tension, along with other things. The drive system, shown here in blue, is when you have a job to do, be that the housework, gardening, school run, work, DIY, visiting the in-laws, anything that provides you with that sense of achievement once you've done it or whilst you're doing it. The satisfaction you get from ticking that task off of your to-do list. This is the dopamine released and dopamine is a neurotransmitter and plays a part in the pleasure in how we feel pleasure. These two systems are both active systems. They both excite the sympathetic nervous system, meaning they both increase the heart rate, breathing rate, that muscle tension. This is all well and good, but if they are always activated, it's exhausting. Being in chronic pain is tiring. The effort required to keep the muscles tight is high. And even when we do have that massage or that warm bath, the tension quickly comes back. So we have the soothe system shown here in green. This is activated when we go, oh, Anything that provides you with that sense of peace, love, feeling valued, content. A hug with a loved one, be that human or a furry one. Being outdoors in nature, listening to music, the smell of fresh bed linen. Immediately you get that. <sighs> the muscles relax. You slow down. I've even slowed down my talking. This is due to the hormones endorphin and oxytocin, which inhibit the sympathetic nervous system and excite the parasympathetic nervous system. If you think of para parachute, that calming down. This allows the body to rest, repair, sleep, all those lovely words. But the issue we have when we're in chronic pain is that our systems don't look balanced like this slide but they look more like this. Our body is bouncing between threat and drive. We are in pain, but we push through. We get that sense of achievement from doing the task, but then we pay for it because the pain flares up. We also live in a world that's 24 seven, on demand TV, news, box sets, shops, online this, online that. So no wonder when I ask my patients, how do you switch off? How do you relax? I often get a long pause and then a response such as I don't have time or well, when I do stop I tend to fall asleep on the sofa in front of the TV. So how can we find ways of regaining some of that balance as when we do we are better able to manage our pain and the other threats which we deal with on a daily basis. So here we have a couple of suggestions. Cold water. I am not suggesting jumping in full immersion into an icy cold lake, you'll be glad to hear. Although more and more people are trying open water swimming, which does have its health benefits, both physical and mental, but I'm not, I'm not saying you need to do that. 
But what I am suggesting is running your wrists under cold water. So this does two things. One, it brings you to the right here, right now, which allows you to ask yourself, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? And what do I need right now? It also, so as I mentioned previously, threat and drive are both very active systems. And as a result, your core body temperature can rise very slightly. So running your wrists under that cold water can help to cool the body down. Plus, it's really easy. So every time you wash your hands, you just finish it off with the cold tap. And nowadays, how often are we washing our, our hands with COVID? Quite a bit. Another way is movement. So the body wants to move. But when you have chronic pain, this can sometimes aggravate your symptoms. A question I often get asked is how do I know when I've done too much? As I often don't feel it at the time, but later. So my response to that is to stay within the soft edge of your pain. Let me explain. Pain is a little bit like a two year old. So it's going, hello, hello. It's tugging at you, hello, hello, hello. If it waits until we sh until it shouts, it will learn to just shout whenever it wants us to hear it or to take notice of it. However, if we're able to notice when our body is talking to us, taking a couple of moments to tune in, to listen, to ask ourselves those questions. What am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? And what do I need right now? We can then adapt modify, do what is needed. So that may be going to the loo, getting a drink, standing up, stretching. However, if we just wait or we push through until our body is shouting or screaming at us, then we have missed that opportunity to manage our symptoms optimally and we'll need to then be firefighting them instead. So movement can be anything that gets our heart rate up. What we are doing is maintaining our strength and conditioning, preventing that deconditioning from happening as shown in that graph earlier. Movement doesn't have to be just exercise, although obviously as a physio, I'm absolutely going to endorse exercise, sport, going to the gym. But I also endorse walking the dog, doing the housework, bread making, I mean, kneading dough, that can definitely raise the heart rate, dancing to the music on the radio, playing with the children or the grandchildren, gardening, anything that you enjoy. But don't wait for the body to shout at you before you stop. Remember to take those pauses to check in and to notice. You are not doing any harm. Remember, pain does not always equal harm. And it is there to protect you. But in order to improve our pain threshold, we need to not push into that hard edge of pain, but to work within that soft edge and not be scared of that. Remembering also that this edge is plastic, meaning it's changeable. And as it changes, adapting that soft edge accordingly. And it changes because it's dependent on what we're feeling, what is going on around us, as well as our physical activity. And finally, breathing. When we are in that active state, our breathing rate will rise due to increased oxygen demand on our body. So it can get to a more neutral state. We don't have the power to directly calm our heart rate, but we can consciously control our breathing rate. So by slowing the breath, using the diaphragm rather than the accessory muscles, we can indirectly influence our heart rate and get to a more balanced state. And there are lots of breathing methods out there, but I've chosen a couple here. So the five finger breathing, let me explain. So if you have your palm out in front of you and you use the index finger on your other hand, just to trace around your, your fingers. And as you go up, you breathe in. And exhale as you go down. 
Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. The simple as five fingers. Balloon breathing. So imagine your belly as a balloon. And as you're breathing in, you inflate your belly like you're inflating a balloon. And as you exhale the balloon, your belly relaxes. So it's just imagining your balloon, the, your belly as a balloon. Flower breathing. Again, imagine you're smelling a beautiful scented flower. Close your eyes. Imagine the scene. Feeling relaxed and inhale the scent. And relax the breath back out. Square breathing. Depending on how you're feeling will depend on the length of the sides. So I would suggest starting with maybe three or four second sides. So you breathe in for three. Hold for three. Out for three. Hold for three. And just repeat. And as you feel comfortable, you can increase the sides of the square. Finally, you can just relax wherever you are. Pop one hand on your chest and the other on your belly. And just focus on the rise and fall of your body and where you're feeling it. Just noticing. Not judging. Not changing it. And just sit like that for about 30 seconds. Or longer if you have time. And just see how you feel. Finally, I have this list of resources which will also be attached to the email. So have a look at these and be curious. There's no right and wrong. It's your body, it's your pain, and it's trying to find the tools that work best for you. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen. And we will see you soon.